we're going to enter the Word of God, so we will always do that with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for your Word, and we thank you for the gift of your Son. And we also solicit the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and lives to your Word and help us, Father, to be more pleasing in thy sight, to grow in grace and the knowledge of him. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we're exploring the epistle to the Ephesians, which many regard as the highest ground in the New Testament. And we are in chapter 3, which is the last chapter of the first half. And uh, so, in in this, this chapter, we'll be broken into two parts. The first part is basically Paul's explanation of his ministry which is very distinctive, very unique, and we'll want to understand that, the first 12 verses. And the last part is the second of two prayers that occur in this epistle, his intercession for the saints. So for this cause, Paul, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, and by the way, this, for this cause, I, Paul, that, that uh, conjunctive clause is going to be repeated in verse 14. From verse 1 to 14 is a interjectory sentence. But for this cause, I, Paul, um, and he, this, this, this statement is interrupted. This is, is going to be interrupted uh, for um, 13 verses. <laughs> and uh, so he, that's the way Paul starts. I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And he's going to digress in this opening to discuss a mystery. There's a sort of a literary parenthesis, and he's going to explain a dispensational parenthesis, the church. The church itself is like a parenthesis in God's dealing with Israel all the way through the Scripture. From call of Abraham in Genesis 12 on the story of Israel. And it's going to continue to be the story of Israel after the church, but there is this insertion here of this strange parenthesis. And uh, the first thing we note here that Paul calls himself a prisoner. And then he he connects this imprisonment to the Gentiles. He's a prisoner of Rome because of his speech to the Gentiles. He'd been arrested in Jerusalem and was making a defense, his defense, to to his people. And they listened to him until he got to the word Gentiles. Then a riot broke loose, and the Romans had to arrest him to save his life. And uh, the relationship between the Gentiles and the Jews was a big problem in the early church. We see that emerge in Acts 10 and Acts 15, deal with those issues, especially Acts 15. Continuing the second verse, Paul says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, the dispensation of grace... And um, a widely misunderstood phrase, by the way, because each dispensation has been by grace. The word dispensation is oikonomia, and uh, it's the economy or or, uh, the rules of management, the stewardship, the law of the house is what it really uh, stood for in a denotative sense. And so this is the stewardship, our stewardship, of God's grace. And God's principles don't change. It was grace through every dispensation. But that is a label that, that is often used to this particular period that we're going to be talking about. And so uh, Augustine, even, way back then, said, distinguish the ages and the Scriptures harmonize. And Paul mentions in, in uh, 1 Timothy 2.15, uh, study show thyself proved rightly dividing the Word of God. So we've talked about the different dispensations. And... Uh, we talked uh, uh, the the traditional view of these dispensations, uh, innocence, conscience. Each one's bounded by some specific uh, events, but it's God's grace all the way through as He reveals His program in this cosmic war that's going on. And of course, the church has a terminus, and that's uh, the kingdom will be set up, and so forth. This is the traditional view of these dispensations. Uh, it has been suggested that a very a slight modification of the traditional view is perhaps reasonable because the tribulation is really again 
a conclusion, if you will, of, the, of God's dealing there with Israel in that sense. So that's another view that uh, has some merit to commend it. But in any case, those are the dispensations. And uh, the classic dispensation, each one involves grace as the basis of salvation. Abel and Abraham brought little lambs to sacrifice to the Lord. That's why Abel's was, Abel was following the instructions. And, uh, but I assume we don't do that anymore. We don't take lambs to our fellowships for sacrifice, do we? So there's something that has changed. Because the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world, was the very identity that John the Baptist introduced Christ. It's a Passover uh, a label that he gave Christ. All the offerings simply pointed to that you know, consummate act on the cross. I think obviously this is very basic stuff. It's grace as to the one chosen, and Paul, it was Paul's undeserved favor to be selected for such a high privilege. It's also grace as to the contents of the message, God's free and unmerited kindness. We did, we didn't, those of us that benefit from grace did nothing to merit it. It's, it's God's grace. And it's, of course, grace to the, to the recipients, as to the recipients. And the Gentiles are the ones in focus here, who are quite unworthy people. And, and the Ephesian church was primarily Gentile, obviously. And so uh, that's going to emerge here. So Paul continues, how that by revelation he made known unto me of the mystery. So we're all talking about a very specific mystery. There's actually 12 mysteries, but this is a very specific one we're going to be focusing on in this whole epistle. And he puts a little parenthesis here. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Word mystery, mysterion. That term in the Greek, as I think you all know, is a little different than we use the word mystery in English. The word mysterion in the Greek term represents a, a sacred divine secret that's he, been unknown up till now, but is here being revealed. And... Uh, it's humanly unknowable, and not, but here it is, divinely revealed. That's the real point of this. There are previous allusions to this in this epistle. We ran into it in chapter 1 and chapter 2 several times. The kingdom of heaven is always twelves. Kingdom of God is seven, seven churches and so forth. Kingdom of heaven is the kingdom on the earth. There are twelve tribes. There are twelve apostles that are destined to rule over those twelve tribes. There are 12 kingdom parables, there are 12 kingdom mysteries, and there are 12,000 sealed from each of the 12 tribes. When we get to the New Jerusalem in Revelation, there are 12 gates and 12 foundation stones, and it's 12,000 furlongs cubed. Hmm? The, uh, so the 12 kingdom parables, are so are the, seven of these you've, you recognize from Matthew 13. And then you have uh, a, a few others that are, literally five others that are added in uh, else, later on in Matthew. But there are 12 kingdom parables. The kingdom of heaven is like whatever. And uh, so, the, uh, and three of them have this strange illusion of the darkness outside. I won't get into that in this discussion. But there are 12 kingdom mysteries. Mystery of the kingdom of God. The, uh, it was kept secret. Mystery of the kingdom of heaven, which is a distinctive mystery. And the mystery of the manifestation, manifestation of the, in the flesh, mystery of the salvation by faith, the uh, mystery of ultimate unity, mystery of Gentiles in the same body. And we just go right through each one of these, mystery of the harpazo. And uh, there, it turns out when you go through the scripture, you'll discover there are 12 of these, mystery of the seven churches, mystery of Israel's blindness, and, uh, mystery, and mystery Babylon. Some of these are very evil mysteries and uh, the counterfeit kingdom, if you will. And so, uh, okay, these mysteries are all finished in Revelation 10, verse 7, interestingly enough. But uh, the whole subject we're exploring in the epistle to the Ephesians is that field of theology called ecclesiology, the study of the church. It is a distinctive uh, uh, issue before God, the church. And Paul's theme is Christ and the church. The eternal plan of God to gather all things in Christ Jesus is what's involved. You'll also discover that Paul divides people into three categories, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. Even a Jew, when he becomes a believer, a member of the church, he, he, he doesn't lose his Jewishness, but he is then in a distinctive 
a calling that is uh, very special. The letter of Ephesians begins in eternity past, and it's going to carry us all the way into eternity future. It's the high ground of the New Testament in the minds of many authors, uh, 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 scholars, commentaries. In every sense, Ephesians is Paul's greatest word on the church, teaching us what the church is in the mind of God and what it ought to be in, the, in practice in the, uh, before the eyes of men. So it gives us the theory, and it's also going to give us The first three chapters of the epistle are doctrine, the concepts, the, the ideas. The last three chapters of the epistle of Ephesians are the practical how-to that derive from all of that. So in the Old Testament, just to summarize the Old Testament for a minute, God revealed through prophecy his program for the people of Israel from the call of Abraham he actually even alluded to in the Garden of Eden, uh, telling Eve that, uh, of the, re- the Redeemer that would come through man. But in chapter 12 of Genesis, he specifically calls Abraham and uh, that he would uh, establish them in their kingdom. That's a Jewish kingdom when they receive their Messiah. And then through Israel, he would convert the Gentiles. That's the perspective that was laid down in the Old Testament. And God offered them that kingdom. This is something we often miss studying our New Testament. They were offered that kingdom through the ministry of John the Baptist. And what did they do for John the Baptist? They let him get killed. It was offered a second time through Christ's ministry. And the Jews asked him to be slain. And then it was offered through the apostles and Stephen, who the Jews themselves actually did kill. So three times, maybe more, but at least three specific times, they were off the kingdom and the, the response was to murder the messenger. And so three offers were made to them, but the nation rejected each of them. They rejected the father who had sent the, uh, John. They rejected the son, of course, and they rejected the spirit who was energizing the witnessing prophets, uh, apostles. And with the death of Stephen, the offers of the kingdom ceased temporarily. The message went out to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles in Acts 8 and Acts 10. And that's, uh, that, uh, that's what makes them so profoundly significant. In the meantime, Paul was saved miraculously. That's Acts 9 between those two chapters. And so Jew and Gentile, the fact they'd both be, that they both could be saved was known to the 12 in John 10. But it still took Peter and the sheet, if you recall, in Acts 10, kill and eat, to highlight the fact that the door, God was opening the door to the Gentiles in a very different way. And... Uh, Paul was a prisoner for this very reason, because he, he and he mentioned that mystery in, in Romans 16, 1 Corinthians, elsewhere. And uh, this idea of the mystery was mentioned by the Lord himself in Matthew 13, but it was even hidden from the angels, we'll discover. We're going to talk more about that as we go forward here in this, in this epistle. Now, the question is, how does what is being talked about here differ from what had been revealed in the Old Testament. You can read in Isaiah and elsewhere that Gentiles were destined to be blessed. Gentiles were destined to be saved. What is this mystery then? There's no mystery to that. That's in the Old Testament. No, there's a distinction here that is the critical thing for us not to miss. See, Israel is restored to a covenant relationship. The Gentiles are brought to a place of a special blessing through them. That was the past, that that we were blessed through them. Now we have the church... God calling out a people for, his, for, uh, uh, for the heavens to be um, the body and bride of his son throughout the ages to come and through whom he is going to administer the affairs of the redeemed universe. Israel gets the land. The church gets the universe. Very different concept being espoused here. The number of the kingdom of heaven is 12. You saw that, 12, 12, 12. The, the church is... a element of the kingdom of God, which are always seven, seven churches and so on. But continuing here, verse 5, Paul says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. So we want to be alert to what is distinctive here. It isn't just that Gentiles can be saved. In other ages was not made known, Paul says. And so therefore that means it's not in the Old Testament. And that Expression is used in Romans 16, Colossians 1, as well as Matthew 13. When when Jesus gives those seven parables in Matthew 13, 
He explains to them what he's revealing to them is that which was uh, hidden since the foundation of the earth. Well, if it's hidden since the foundation of the world, that means it's not in the Old Testament, obviously. And he was revealing it there in Matthew 13. So none of this either in the Old Testament or the coming kingdom. The Old Testament predicted the call of the Gentiles all through the Old Testament. Isaiah 11, 42, 49, 55, 60, etc., etc. But see, it didn't present them there as fellow members of the body. That's something that the, that the Jews were the chosen people. No, there's another thing coming that's even a higher, a higher thing in a sense. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. That's, okay, that's the key word, fellow heirs. And of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Paul had already mentioned this con- in concept. But now he's explaining the impact of what he calls the sacred secret. And Paul's discussion is the most complete definition we have. Because he already mentioned this in chapter 1 and chapter 2, as you, 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 you know, recall. That we're fellow members of one body. There's no distance or disadvantage to the Gentile anymore. Fellow partakers of the promise of the Holy Spirit. That is the staggering insight that Paul is trying to get across to us, how distinctive, how unique that is, never before revealed. In verse 6, he states that the mystery clearly that believing Gentiles and Jews are one body in Christ. A staggering truth, staggering in its implication to the Gentiles, hard to swallow by the Jews, even to this day. Even to this day, you can join Messianic fellowships where they love the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're New Testament believers in many respects, except you'll discover they're very uncomfortable with Paul. They have their own little way of not really buying what Paul says. And what you might do is that most of them will accept Peter, and second, Peter authenticates Paul's writings as Scripture. People miss that. So we don't have to apologize for our friend Paul. This mystery had not been made known before this time. But now God reveals it to, not just to Paul, by the way. There's a thing called um, um, hyper-dispensationalism. The idea that only Paul had that that insight. That's not correct. There are other apostles. Paul had the unique, his unique ministry was to the Gentiles. But uh, that truth was not unique just to Paul. God had revealed it to his his apostles and the New Testament prophets by the Spirit. Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, and his message was that of grace. Did you know that there isn't any of the other epistles in the New Testament that use the word grace? And it's all through Paul's letters. There's one exception. Peter does make reference to it once, but not in a salutation. You know, know, grace and peace be to you. He opens and closes his letters, Paul does, with grace. Grace, grace, grace. And that was distinctive in any case. But... uh, Paul's special task was to share the truth of the one body. And that's what we call the mystery of the church. Not church in the sense of these local organizations, no, church in this mystical sense, in the mystery of the church. And that, of course, is all through Romans and Colossians as well as Ephesians. Ephesians. But it's interesting how um, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, makes reference to this. He said, But contrary, when they saw that the gospel of uncircumcision, that is to the Gentiles, was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. In other words, Peter and Paul had specializations. They both would speak to whoever they could, it could, but Peter's mission, his burden was to the Jews. Paul's special mission, in fact, all 12 went to the Jews, by the way. But that's, that's the point he's really making here, that Paul and Peter came to that understanding that it was Paul's, Paul wished he was speaking to the Jews because they were his, brother, his brethren. He uses that term. But he realizes God, uh, Jesus, in his wisdom, called him to speak, to, to bring the gospel to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles. And Peter uh, took, to, even though he was used in Acts chapter 10 to open the door to the Gentiles, his primary mission was to the Jews. Peter said it. Okay. To say that the twelve apostles from the beginning understood the mystery of the church is not, is to deny Paul's inspired words here. Even Peter had to have a vision from heaven in Acts 10 before he would go to the Gentiles. 
And the, the truth of the one body was given to Paul, and its significance dawned gradually. It gradually dawned on the rest of the early church. It wasn't unique to Paul, but he was the vehicle by which that aspect was emphasized. So we have the kingdom. Israel blessed as head of the nations. Gentiles blessed through Israel. That was the traditional view. From Adam to Abraham, almost 2,000 years, there were only Gentiles. There were no Jews before Abraham. From Abraham to Christ for 2,000 years, it was Jews and Gentiles. And from Christ to the rapture, it's Jews, Gentiles, and the church. A little distinctive. These are distinctive, and that's why we call them dispensations. They're focus, their style. They're all grace, but God's specific focuses uh, vary there. And in 1 Corinthians 10.32 is one of those places where Paul speaks of three groups, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. If you're a Gentile or a Jew and you accept Christ, you become a member of the church, you are then a member of the church. And you have that distinctive benefit. After the rapture, once again, there are going to be Jews and Gentiles. And once again, it's going to be a a different kind of a dispensation. That's one of the interesting things that partitions the book of Revelation. Because after, ver- after chapter 3, verse 2 and 3 are about the seven churches, but after chapter 3, there is no mention of the churches from that point on. It's, in fact, it's very, it gets very, very Jewish. We have the, the uh, in the seventh seal, the 12,000 meets tribe and all that business. So calling. Israel gets temporal blessings in earthly places, and God's chosen there were earthly people, Amos 9 and elsewhere. And God has not negated His promises to Israel, but they're earthly promises. The church, spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. That's the focus. Very, very different calling. And the ultimate of that, of course, is the heavenly bride of Christ to to co-reign with Him. Wow. That's what Revelation 21 and following deals with. That leads this whole business of the millennium. Most churches have no grasp of the millennium. Many of them treat it as allegories. Israel is to be blessed under the rule of Christ. That's what Hosea is all about. The church will reign with him over the entire universe. That's what Ephesians 1 tried to get across. God's program today is not the headship of Israel, but the headship of Christ over his church. That's our emphasis today. That's the focus we have today. That's the focus in the the, uh, epistle of the Ephesians. We are under a different stewardship from that of Moses and the prophets. And we must be careful not to confuse what God has clarified. You and I are not under Moses. The church is not the same as Israel. The church is not the same as the kingdom. The kingdom is very Jewish. It's a unique fellowship, the most privileged body of believers we, we read about the Bible. There's all these different groups that you talk about the Bible, the tribulation saints and this and that, all these different groups. The church is the most unique and the most privileged of them all. And um, that's exciting to, to, to understand. The church didn't exist before the ascension. Christ had to ascend to allow the Holy Spirit, the freedom, and, to come in and, and deal with us in Acts chapter 2. They were, the church was formed by the baptism of the Spirit. That's what it actually means in 1 Corinthians 12. The church will be completed at a date certain. There's a point at which you don't add to the church anymore. The harpazo, the rapture, completes this strange entity called the body of Christ. The Lord reveals all of this in Matthew 13 in those seven parables. He reveals a great deal about it, actually. Because he has seven letters, the Lord. He has seven parables in Matthew 13, and the Lord himself has seven letters to those churches in, Matthew t- in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. And it's a rather provocative exercise to realize that Paul wrote seven churches. And uh, see the parallelism that occurs between those seven churches and the seven letters to seven churches by Jesus Christ in Revelation 2 and 3. I'll leave that to you as an exercise. That leads to another topic, and it's got this strange label called covenant theology. Most pastors and most denominational churches, churches that have their heritage from the Reformation, uh, uh, embrace a theological perspective called covenant theology. And what makes this 
confusing to me. It's just the opposite of what you would think it would be called because they do not um, recognize that the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are not un, were unconditional commitments. And um, so it's the, it's the recognition that God made unconditional promises to David and the millennium is the fulfillment of those promises. And so groups that ignore this clear-cut statement of Paul that the church is not a revelation of the Old Testament, they treat the, the, the church as a continuation or some people say a replacement of Israel. The church replaces Israel in God's program. No, 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 that's blasphemy. But the people who deny that covenant relationship are called covenant theologians. It's confusing. The label is just the opposite of what you think it would be. And this view started with Augustine. Augustine lived in a day that it was, people were very enamored with Oregon's uh, hermeneutics. Oregon espoused a view that the Bible is all allegorical. Everything there is just symbolic. And, and uh, allegories are a license to invent. And uh, they were under a Roman... Uh, global government at the time. And if you were a pastor, you were paid for by the state. It wasn't popular to preach from the pulpits that the God's going to you know, rid the world of all its evil rulers. <laughs> so they found a way to get around that. Well, God, not literally. God's going to rule in your hearts and so on. So that developed a, uh, under Augustine a theology that uh, skirted this whole idea of the millennium, among other things. We would call that amillennialist. In fact, they would be called in the literature amillennialists. They don't really believe in a literal millennium. Well, that's because they don't recognize in part, that's the only, not the only thing, but they, they don't recognize that the, uh, God's promises to David were unconditional and reconfirmed in the New Testament. Gabriel told Mary that her child would reign, sit on the throne of David. In Acts 15, the pivotal event in, in the early church uh, era, uh, in Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, that was the big issue. And James, the Lord's brother himself, quotes from Amos 9 the very recommitment of Dave, that the tabernacle of David will be reestablished. Uh, by quoting uh, Amos 9, 11, and 12. And so it goes on. But the, the, again, the real division here not just between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism, which is taking the Bible seriously, but how seriously do you take it? If you're out of the Reformation, you'll discover most of the denominations that owe their origin to the Reformation period also tend not to take the Bible that seriously. They, they treat it allegorically. They, they have ways of explaining away this thing rather than to argue God means what He says and says what He means. So we're now... In the field of ecclesiology, the study of the church, that's what this epistle is, its primary emphasis. Paul's theme is Christ in the church. The, and what is this all about? The eternal plan of God to gather all things in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. This letter, the Ephesians, starts at eternity past, goes all the way to eternity future. And in every sense, Ephesians is Paul's greatest word on the church, teaching what it is in the mind of God and what ought to be our practice before men. That's in contrast to ec eschatology, which is the, the uh, literary term for study of the last things, the end times. And if you go into eschatology, the first division that divides people, are you amillennial or premillennial? The amillennialist doesn't believe in a literal millennium. He has a ways of explaining it allegorically. You and I, I believe, would be labeled as premillennial. We believe in a literal millennium. There, it, throughout history, there's been a group that were post-millennial, said we were already in the millennium. We smile at that today. Uh, from the 19th century on, I think, the idea that man was getting better and better sort of evaporated. People began the wars, just got worse, and the idea that we're somehow in the millennium, is, it, it tends to be you know, pretty absurd. Preterism is a, a way of treating amillennialism as saying prophecy has really already been fulfilled, it's past. There's some... Uh, 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 reconstructionism that you could call post-millennial. But in any case, most of us are pre-millennial. Even within that world, they divide into typically three groups. And, de and depending on whether the church itself goes through the, th through the tribulation or not. Most churches that are, are what we would consider liberal are post-tribulation. They think that the, the church is going to go through the tribulation. 
And um, there are others that we identify with where we believe the church uh, is raptured before the tribulation. We're called pre-tribulationists. There is a, small, a smaller group that, believe, that recognizes the truth of the fact that the tribulation is not seven years, it's the last three and a half years. And they argue that, gee, we're, we, 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 the church is taken out before the middle of that week. They're called mid-tribulationists, a strange label, but anyway. Um, but both the, the two on the left, post-tribulation and mid-tribulation, have to deny a doctrine called eminence. Most of us recognize the New Testament teaches that we are to expect Jesus at any moment. Well, you can't really embrace that view if you're post-tribulation or mid-tribulation. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to kid my friend Walter Martin. He used to come in the office and say, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today. Because Donald Gray Barnhouse was pre-trib and Walter you know, tried, he felt that the classical view of the church, historical church at least, was post-tribulational. So they used to have that little debate going on. But the point I want to get across isn't to get into all of that except to point out that most denominations, classical denominations, are on the left side of this diagram. They're amillennial and post-tribulational. And uh, if you uh, are on the, if you, if you, um, if, if we hold the view that would be on the right side of this, premillennial, pre-tribulational. Many people would call us fundamentalists, and indeed we are. The point I really want to get across here that's, I think, interesting, your eschatology will derive from your theory of interpretation called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is your theory about how you interpret the Bible. If you take it very literally, you'll swing to the right end of this diagram. If you're willing to take certain problem passages and just treat them symbolically or allegorically, uh, you would be on the left side. Depending how strict your humanity, if you, your humanities are very permissive, very broad brush, you'll be on the left side. If you're very precise, if you make a big thing of what the words really mean and what he really said and how it all ties together specifically, denotatively, you're on the right end of the diagram. So your hermeneutics determine your eschatology. So I, there is a cycle I'm going to suggest for you to consider as you study, check it out for yourself, uh, what I call epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. How do you know anything? Well, your hermeneutics, I'm suggesting, determines your eschatology. Okay, fair enough. And you saw that in the little diagram that we just uh, developed. Your hermeneutics will determine your eschatology. Okay, I'm indebted to my friend Brian Hughes in Auckland, uh, New Zealand, because we were rapping one evening, and he pointed out that your eschatology determines your ecclesiology. And that was an interesting insight. I think he's right. Because what you really end up believing about the end times will give you a perspective of what is the church specifically all about. And we do that when you get to Revelation and the letters to seven churches, how the seven letters are indeed a prophetic profile. And as you understand your eschatology, that gives you an implication of what the churches really are. How does Sardis and Thyatira differ from Philadelphia, etc., and so on. And so, and what's interesting to me then is that your ecclesiology will also determine your hermeneutics. If you fellowship in a body of believers that take the Bible very seriously, that will give you, you'll tend to be very strict about the, the things you, 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 you'll pick, you, you're willing that you're dealing with very modern, various modern translations, so will derive from your eschatology, which will determine your hermeneutics. Your hermeneutics will determine your eschatology, and your eschatology will impact your ecclesiology. So I think that's kind of provocative. In any case, all three of these are all about Christ. Let's not lose sight of that in any case. But as you study, uh, you might consider those broad implications. Your hermeneutics will determine your eschatology. Your eschatology will impact your ecclesiology, which in turn will color your, uh, your approach to the text itself. Okay, so let's take a look at a another example of this. We were talking about... A, um, Ecclesiology, that's what this epistle is all about. I, want, I don't want you to have any confusion about the 24 elders. In Revelation chapter 4, after 2 and 3, the church is out of there. Get to chapter 4 of Revelation, round about the throne were 4 and 20 seats, or thrones. And upon these seats I saw 4 and 20 elders sitting, clothed with white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. These 24 elders are very prominent from this point on in the book of Revelation. 
And your understanding of what's going on is, very, is going to depend on your understanding. Who, who do they represent? What are these? Okay? The word there, seats, is actually thronos. Those are seats assigned to kings or judges, if you will. And they have on their heads crowns of gold. Now, these, now where do we get 24? The only place 24 shows up in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, is in First Chronicles 24. David divides the priesthood, the Levites, and more specifically the sons of Aaron, into 24 courses, 24 sections, 24 sub- subgroups, 24 courses. And uh, it's interesting that there were non-Levitical priesthood orders in the Bible. Jethro was a priest of Midian. We don't know a lot about that. Jacob gave tithes in Genesis 28. That's long before Levi. So there, were, there was priesthood prior. And of course, the ultimate priesthood in, that's talked about in the Bible is, is the Melchizedekian priesthood, which shows up in Genesis 14 initially, but is then elaborated, and that is quoted in Psalm 110, verse 4, and Jesus himself continues to quote several times from, from Psalm 110. And uh, Hebrews chapter 5 6 and 7. Three chapters of the book of Hebrews develop the implications that Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Big deal. I won't meet that to death here, but just be aware of that. But who are these 24 elders? They apparently represent some kind of completed group. That's what they did in 1 Chronicles 24. The 24 courses represented the whole priesthood. Let me tell you what they cannot be. Most people think they're uh, tribulation believers. Well, Revelation 7 puts that to bed. Revelation 7, Paul, uh, uh, John says, One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? There's a group they're looking at there. Whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. He said, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So those are the tribulation saints. But it's an elder explaining to him who they are. So the 24 elders are not tribulation saints. Or he wouldn't have answered that way, follow me? So that one of the elders answered. So it can't be tribulation believers. Some people think, well, they must represent angels. That's some kind of angelic thing. Well, again, Revelation 7 deals with that. In verse 11 of chapter 7, it says, All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts that fell before the, the four cherubim were there, the 24 elders, and then the angels. In other words, they're distinctive from the four cherubim, and they're distinctive from the elders. So all the angels. So it can't, they can't be the 24. Some people feel like they represent the nation Israel, and that's clearly not true when you study Revelation 7 and 12. What are the distinguishing characteristics of these 24 elders? They're sitting on thrones. They're in white raiment. They have crowns of gold, and they sing, they identify who they are by singing the song of the redeemed. And they're called elders and kings and priests. There's only three people that are kings and priests. Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Jesus Christ is a king and a priest. And so is the believers in the church, our kings and priests. So, now it's interesting to go one step further, I think, give you some another discovery that I think is kind of provocative. There are, all through the Scripture, places where within a verse or two, there is a, an implied gap that we discover. If we know the picture and we see this verse, we know there's a gap between the two. Between Genesis, first two verses, Genesis is perhaps the most famous one. In Psalm 22, between verse 21 and 22, there's a gap. Psalm 118, the middle, verse 22. Psalm, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, after the first clause. Um, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and so forth. Isaiah 53 in the middle of verse 10. You go through each one. In, in Isaiah 61, right in the middle of the second verse, Jesus in Luke 4 is re- reading from that passage, stops at a comma, says, this day is this fulfilled in your ears, and closes the book and, 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 and says, and this day is it, forget, is, is it uh, uh, fulfilled in your ears. That comma has lasted uh, about 2,000 years. There's a gap, if you will, Highlighted, but none other than Jesus Christ in the middle of verse 2 of Isaiah 61. Lamentation 4. Daniel 9, uh, between verses 26 and 27. Verse 26 is a gap, uh, uh, an interval between 25 and 27, in effect. 
when you study, well, we can go through each one of these if we wanted to. What's in, in, and there's even a gap in the, in the passage that James quotes in Acts 15. But we can go in, and, and if we make an inventory of all of these, and I won't take you through each one here. Luke 4 is where Jesus is quoting, but he's quoting from the same, the number 6 here. What's fascinating is how many of these are there? There's 24. And in my peculiar perceptions, I think that's deliberate design. And it doesn't surprise me at all that there are 24 dispensational gaps in the biblical text itself. And it takes a great deal of diligence and commitment to, to put that in perspective, I believe. And I invite you to do so. Let's move on. Back picking up Ephesians verse 7, chapter 3. Paul says, Whereof, whereof all that mystery and stuff, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Paul says, I was made a minister. See, Paul's own ministry was to the church. And the word minister by the here is deaconess, which is the word from which we get the word deacon, which simply means servant. Okay. So uh, he, Paul's explaining in these 7, 8, 9, his own ministry here. Effectual working of his power. The word here is energia, energy, take it. And power is the word from which we get the word dynamite. Dunamis. And he's already mentioned the resurrection power of Christ back in chapter 1. He's going to mention it again in this chapter before we're finished. The resurrection power of Christ. And why is that so important? Because it's available to you and me. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that's available for you and I daily in our, in our daily lives. He continues unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Less than the least of the saints. That was, that's a comparative of a superlative. There's no feigned humility here by Paul. Calls himself in 1 Timothy the chief of sinners. And of course, uh, brings to memory all the persecutions that describe in Acts and that he alludes to in Galatians and Philippians and so on. Understanding the deep truths of God's Word does not give man a big head. It gives him a broken and contrite heart. Less than the least of all saints, he calls himself. A special commission to the Gentiles. In fact, he adopts the name Paul, which in Latin means Paulus or little. Unsearchable riches. Actually, it, literally, it's the untraceable riches. You cannot detect the mystery of the one body we're talking about, of Christ, in the Old Testament Scriptures. It's a mystery that was hidden in Christ Himself. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, and created all, who, cre who created all things by Jesus Christ. The word fellowship here, and the word fellowship here is koinonia, and very close, close kin to the word dis dispensation itself, oikonomia, in verse 2. And uh, the new creation of God that was hidden from all the eight previous ages. Why was it hidden? A surprising thing in verse 10 here. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenlies might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Let's stop and think about that. It's a pretty big sentence here. To the intent that now unto whom unto the principalities and powers in the heavenlies. This whole drama that we're party, uh, party of, part of, um, is, has the intent of teaching the angels. They learn the manifold wisdom of God by watching what God is doing with and through us. Boy, that's strange. It's almost like we're on a stage and they're the audience watching. One of God's present purposes is to reveal His manifold wisdom to the angelic hosts of the heaven. And that's in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 10, 11, 12. Talk about that. That the angels desire to look into. The angels rejoice at the repentance of one lost sinner, we know from Luke 15. They watch the activities of the local churches, we learn in 1 Corinthians 11. Well, you and I, we're a spectacle to them. They learn about God and His grace and His love and His power and all those things by watching us as a spectacle. And they're watching all the time. 
They're watching when we don't think anyone's looking. <laughs> the manifold wisdom of God. The word there is a word really means the, uh, like the intricate beauty of a very, em- you know, of an embroidered pattern, if you will. Yet all of this is foolishness to the unsaved. The wisdom of God is foolishness to them that perish. The precise line of thought that Paul's trying to get across is God from eternity had a purpose to put the Jew and the Gentile on precisely the same footing, but he concealed it for many ages until he revealed it in the apostolic age where he appointed Paul as minister to be the announcer of this. That's the flavor of this whole thing. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ our Lord. His eternal purpose. The church is not some kind of divine afterthought because, gee, they rejected the kingdom. No, it's, a, it's part of God's eternal purpose. To ignore this truth is a sin against the Father who planned it, the Son whose death made it possible, and the Spirit who today works in our lives to accomplish what God has planned. God has a plan, and you're part of it. God has a plan, and you're part of it. God's foreknowledge and counter-strategy, incarnation, death, resurrection, ascension, all that... And the glorification of Christ. That's his, all because he, he, he saw it all coming. He made sure it would, he, he predetermined it. And by the way, Satan knows the scriptures. And by, by keeping his program for the church hidden, God prevented Satan from hindering the plan in advance. Satan took Christ to the cross, and by so doing, he sealed his own doom. It's tragic today when we see pastors and churches wandering about aimlessly in their ministries because they do not understand God's purpose for the church in this age. If they move out beyond the message of Acts 1, the first six uh, chapters, and into the Ephesians and the uh, the Colossians, they wouldn't be wasting time, talent, and money. They'd be uh, trying to build the kingdom. They'd instead be building the church. That's what we're all about. Not building the kingdom, building the church. Christ is going to build the kingdom. How he has sent from heaven's best for earth's worst. How he has redeemed his enemies at enormous cost. And how he's conquered them by love. And prepared them as a bride for his son. And they see that through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, more glory has come to God and more blessing has come to believing Jews and Gentiles than if sin had never been allowed to enter. Wow, that's a big one. God has been vindicated. Christ has been exalted. Satan has been defeated. The church has been thrown in Christ to share his glory. That's the gist of this whole thing. So Paul continues, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Consequence. What's the consequences? We have access to the throne of God. We can go to it boldly without fear of being scolded. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He's very concerned that as you hear about the troubles Paul has, that you don't lose heart. I was like, that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. It's a very delicate and touching request that they shouldn't be too much distressed by what he was suffering for them. This is very similar to Epaphroditus in Philippians, where they're, they're, he was so upset that they found out how he was distressed because he knew they, they loved him so much they'd be unnecessarily distressed. Interesting. For this cause I now bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For what cause? For this cause. This is where this is what he started in verse one. We've gone through fourteen verses in this excursion about the ministry. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of Lord Jesus Christ. This is the second prayer in this epistle. Okay? The first one was a prayer for an enlightenment. That was in chapter one, verse fifteen to twenty three. This is the second prayer for enablement. And really continues what he started, his first breath was in verse 1. What he's really saying in effect is, I want you to get your hands on your wealth. Realize how vast it is and start to use it. He went to God in prayer that these great truths might become realities in our lives, yours and mine. That's what he's concerned for here. It's interesting, by the way, he goes to his knees. Now, I don't think you have to go on your knees to pray, but I think there's something special about doing so. And uh, there's no special posture required, but there's something, you, certainly psychologically, you need to be on your knees. Abraham stood when he was praying for Sodom in Genesis 18. Solomon stood at the prayer of dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8. David sat before the Lord in 1 Chronicles 17. So there's no one way to do these things. Jesus fell on his face at Gethsemane. 
And when you can, when it works out, that's what I do. As we sometimes facetiously say, suck carpet. Probably a little irreverent, but okay. It's the posture of the soul that's important. It's also interesting that he always addresses his prayer to the Father. That's what Jesus instructed us to do in, in Matthew 6, and that's what Paul invariably does, prays to the Father in Jesus' name. Notice this business of long prayers. Have you ever noticed that biblical prayers are often very brief? Like you and I go for telegrams. We just text message them, huh? Moses' great prayer for Israel was three verses. Elijah on Mount Carmel was one verse. Nehemiah's great prayer, the one that he's famous for, is seven verses. Jesus in John 17, that's his big prayer. John 17 is word for word, Jesus praying to his Father. What we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 is really should be called the Disciples' Prayer. He was teaching the disciples how to pray. The Lord's Prayer was John 17. But you can read the whole thing in five minutes. If that was his prayer, that's five minutes, uh, five minute prayer. Heavy stuff. But Paul continues, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. By the way, there's no such thing as the universal fatherhood of God. That's a pagan term. That's a globalist term. If a universal fatherhood that saves all men. No. Quite the contrary. You must be born again, is what the Scripture says again and again and again. Believers are sons of God by rebirth. You weren't born. You were born a son of Adam. Alienated from God. Lost. No. It's your, if you're reborn is what we're talking about. John 3, uh, uh, and uh, on it goes. There are four petitions here in Paul's prayer. Each one is sequential. There, he prays for strength, then depth, then apprehension, and then fullness. Four key words. Strength, depth, apprehension, and fullness. If I was seminary trained, I'd make that alliterative, but I don't. Strength, depth, apprehension, fullness. Let's take a look at him here. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. To grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might of his Spirit in the inner man. According to, not out of, in proportion, not just a, por- por- a portion, in proportion to the riches of his glory. Next one is strength. The presence of the Holy Spirit is evidence of, Oh, excuse me, the first one is, the presence of the Holy Spirit is evidence of salvation from Romans 8. The power of the Spirit is for enablement of mature, stable, intelligent Christians. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many are mature, stable, intelligent Christians here, but you get the idea. Jesus himself performed his ministry on the earth in the power of the Spirit, not as the power of the Son of the God, the power of the Spirit. That's a distinction that can be very, very important as you really undertake a study in pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. That Jesus, when He's on the earth, performed His ministry in the power of the Spirit. By the way, there are 59 references to the Spirit just in the book of Acts. That's a quarter of the total of the whole New Testament. Continue, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might uh, by the, His Spirit in the inner man. Now we get the very interesting term here, the inner man. And uh, it's interesting that all of Paul's prison prayers, the ones in Philippians, Colossians, and the ones here in Ephesians, deal with the spiritual condition of the inner man and not with material needs of the body. He's a prisoner. You'd think he'd be concerned about material needs. No, not at all. He's focusing on just the opposite. The inner man. We're going to talk a little. What is the, the outer man is passing away every day. Have you noticed that? I have. <laughs> the inner man. The inner man of the lost sinner is de- the inner man of the lost sinner is dead, but it becomes alive when Christ is invited in. So we call the new birth. What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit empower the inner man? What does that mean? Fancy words that our spiritual faculties are controlled by God, and we're exercising them and growing in the Word. Unfortunately, we do that imperfectly, but that's the goal. That's what we should be doing. Hebrews 5 deals with that. The inner man can see, according to Psalm 119. It can hear, according to Matthew 13, 9. 
It can taste, according to Psalm 34, 8. It can feel, according to Acts 17. But he must be exercised, 1 Timothy 4, and cleansed in Psalm 51, and washed by the Word in Ephesians 5. We're going to explain that when we get to the fifth chapter. And also needs to be fed. In fact, like manna daily. And you can't gather for somebody else. Inner man can see, hear, taste, feel. But also must be exercised, cleansed, washed by the Word. This is a concept throughout the Scripture. And renewed daily. Oh boy, there's the rub. Do you renew your inner man daily? Second Corinthians 4. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love... Wow. There are three pictures here with three words. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Dwell means to settle down, feel at home. The Lord fell at home with Abraham at the Oaks of Bomber. He stopped by and had, to, had a child with him. The Lord wasn't comfortable in Lot's house. He sent the other two angels to take care of all of that. He didn't feel. Does the Lord feel comfortable in your home? Have you made your home such that he would be comfortable there? The Lord did not come to us as a temporary visitor, but as a permanent resident with unrestricted access to your life. Oh boy. Are there parts of your life that you've closeted away from him? Okay, the second of three words is rooted. A tree must have roots deep in the soil if it's to have nourishment and stability. Rooted. Very similar word, grounded. That's an architectural term. Sound foundations is the idea. The storm that blows reveals the strength of the roots or the soundness of foundation. Pretty similar concepts echoing each other. I want you to notice the Trinity that we've just gone through these four verses. The Father was in verse 14, the Holy Spirit in verse 16, the Son in verse 17. The Trinity has got His imprint throughout this entire epistle. But there's an even bigger surprise coming. I'm in love with the next verse because for a couple of reasons. I think there's some interesting things there, and I also notice there isn't one commentary in a hundred that picks up on it. So you're going to get a treat here. Verse 18 of Ephesians. Paul says, to be, So you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Comprehend should actually be translated apprehend, lay hold of. It comes from the Latin root um, prehender, which is to grasp. And you get a feeling, if you've ever played with a monkey that has a parental tail, you know, they can actually grab with their tail. It's, that's where they get the term, parental tail. That's where the term comes. To apprehend, to lay hold of is the thought here. To be able to lay hold of with all saints. See, it's possible to understand something without making it your own. You may understand, but you don't grasp it. It's not yours. You follow me? That's what he's after here. With all saints. And uh, see, without the other saints, our comprehension is incomplete. You comprehend with all saints if you're together in a group. Small, that's why small groups are so important. And truths often emerge from within a small group. If you've been in a small group Bible study, you'll notice often the, a truth will come to light that nobody brought in the door. It shows up within the group. And that's when you see the Holy Spirit moving. It's a thrilling thing to see happen. Uh, what is that breath? The word breath is platos, suggesting great extent. It also can mean time. The word length, mikos, which means length, depth, bathos, like a bathosphere, a deep diving bell kind of thing. Depth, height, the deep things of God is, is suggested here. And height. Height of a place, like of heaven or of rank. Okay, got breadth, length, depth, and height. I think that's rather fascinating because there are four dimensions there. And the great discovery of 20th century science, Einstein's theory of relativity, is that space time is a four dimensional continuum. We don't live in just three dimensions, we live in four. And I think that is tucked away here in Ephesians deliberately by those. I don't say, I'm not suggesting Paul had that physics insight, but I know, I know the Holy Spirit did. 
See, time is not uniform. It's a physical property. It varies mass, acceleration, gravity. We went through that little tutorial earlier in one of our earlier sessions. We live in more than three dimensions. Apparently, 10 is the current est scientific estimate. We've just gone beyond Euclid. When you, if you went to school, you had Euclidean geometry, a geometry of three dimensions. That's called Euclidean geometry. In 1854, George Riemann's introduced the concept of metric tensors. It took 60 years before that was used practically by Einstein developing his theory of relativity. Because he, using metric tensors, realized that we live in four-dimensional space-time, not three. He went to his death frustrated because he couldn't reconcile light and supergravity. But in 1953, Kaluza and Klein, just doing the same thing he did, going up, adding dimensions, resolved the issues of light and supergravity. And then in 1963, 10 years later, Yang Mills uh, 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 collaborated uh, on the Yang Mills fields, which reconcile electromagnetic and both nuclear forces. So since 1984, the current thinking in, in the frontiers of physics is that there are, it's, uh, uh, our uh, physical existence is conducted by superstrings, ten-dimensional, um, uh, ten-dimensional space, and uh, so what's interesting to me is Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage of the 13th century, recognized from the text of Genesis that the, we live in ten dimensions; only four are knowable, six are not knowable in his thing. And particle physicists today have concluded that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly measurable, three spatial in time, six are curled in less than ten to minus thirty-three centimeters, and are only inferable by indirect means. So I think that's fascinating. We spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators only to learn what Nachmanides concluded from studying the text of Genesis 1. But in any case, Paul wants us to live in four dimensions. Breadth and sense of the whole world... And same thing the length, the cross, the heavenlies, the extent of His grace, eternity to eternity, to understand the depth of our predicament and uh, the height that we uh, enjoy being joint heirs with the ruler of the universe. And so you can, you can take each one of these and, and apply them. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. I have no idea what that is. The fullness of God. Is there a paradox here? How can we know that which passes knowledge? It's, it's intrinsically, it would seem like a paradise. Sort of like a baby's confidence in its mother's arms. The fullness of God, wow. Can you even imagine being filled with the fullness of God? I can't, I can't conceive that. The very words go beyond comprehension to me. The means of all this is the Holy Spirit, and the measure is God itself. It's God Himself. God's going to, Paul's going to have a lot more to say about the fullness later, so we'll explore that when we get to chapter 5. Now unto Him who is able to do exceeding abundant of all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Here is Paul building one of his pyramids again. He pyramids these sentences. Able to do... This translates the potential to the, the potential to the actual. What we ask or think, no, no. All that we ask or think, no, no. Above all that we ask or think, well, no, no. Abundantly above all that we ask or think, no, no, no. Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You can get a glimpse here of how in Greek you can put more information. It, it often takes five sentences to just reflect the information in one Greek verb. And we get a flavor of that here, you know. Now, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Whew. Heavy stuff. Use, Paul uses every word possible to convey to us the vastness of God's power as found in Jesus Christ. And again, I want you to notice the Trinitarian emphasis here. He prays to the Father concerning the indwelling Spirit made available through the Son. Whew. Father, Spirit, and Son. Trinity again. Unto Him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 
And so we have praise just like Psalm 148. And his question, is his power active in your life? That's Paul's concern. He says, get your hands on your spiritual wealth by opening your heart to the Holy Spirit, praying for the strength for the inner man, for a new depth of love, for spiritual apprehension, and for spiritual fullness. That should be your goal. That should be your passion. That should be your prayer. And James would remind you that you have not because ye ask not. So in our next session, we're going to start the second half of this incredible epistle. The first three chapters were about doctrine, heavy stuff. It took us three sessions just to get through the first chapter. And we didn't come near exploiting, exploiting it at all. The next three chapters, four, five, and six, are duties. What's our response to all of this? So you're going to start by studying chapter four. We're going to shift gears and get into very practical stuff. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we can't help but be overwhelmed as we begin to glimpse the riches we enjoy and that are available to us right now through the Holy Spirit, made possible by the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we, we would just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would reveal these things to us and help us to apprehend, to grasp our riches in Christ Jesus. Oh, Father, we would ask this, that He might be glorified. We ask this, that we might be more pleasing in Your sight. We ask this, that we might be more effective for You as stewards of the incredible opportunities that place before us. We thank you, Father, for these incredible truths. And we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, they might bear fruit for you, Father, as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.